Um, professor Eric Swingedau is the speaker. Eric is a professor of geography uh, here at Manchester University, School of Environment Development. Uh, previously, he was professor of geography at Oxford University, fellow Oxford University, and fellow of St Peter's College until 2006. His research interests include political ecology, urban governance, democracy and political power, water, water resources, the political economy of capitalist societies, and the politics of globalization. He has published over 100 papers on these themes, and recent books include Urbanizing Globalization, uh, co-edited with Oxford University Press, Social Power in the Urbanization of Water, Flows of Power, again Oxford University Press, uh, In the Nature of Cities, co-edited and um, published by Routledge, and a monograph uh, on nature, modernity, and Spain uh, is forthcoming with MIT Press. Uh, so. Thank you very much, Amelia. Usually it's a pleasure to uh, speak um, at occasions like this, but today I am suffering very much from intensive PhD training fatigue. <laughs> <laughs> My apologies for that. I would also like to uh, welcome, as you probably haven't met her yet, uh, Saska Petrova. This is the woman in, white, in, in yellow and black there. I welcome her here, not just because it's great to have her here, but we will have her for a long, long time here. She's our new colleague, uh, just appointed in uh, Geography in the School of Environment and Development, and even more importantly, she is also a political ecologist working on themes like biodiversity, nature preservation, and energy issues. Welcome. And an activist. Obviously. And an activist. <laughs> Thank so she fits in really well. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, secondly, um, until last week, I thought I was going to talk about something different than what I'm actually going to talk about. I wanted to talk about metabolism and circulation, urban metabolism and urban circulation. It's one of the papers that I put on the website um, in the Dropbox thing. But then I thought, why should I talk about something that all of you can read? about anyway. So I changed my mind just two days ago about what I was going to present. So this is a bit more tentative and we'll really try to focus on a number of issues and themes that I think are unresolved. Because many of us are always asked, why do you do what you're doing? Sure, you're interested in environmental conflict here, there, wherever, but why? What is new, interesting, different? What should I learn from someone who's doing work in the Amazon or in the Himalayas or whatever? What should I learn, not everyone else, learn from that? And that's sometimes a question that's extremely difficult to answer. Um, uh, and I don't always have answers to these questions either. So what I want to focus on towards the end of my talk are the set of issues that I think political ecology or urban political ecology in this case really needs to uh, 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 take a bite at. My main ambition as an academic interested in questions of cities, societies and nature is to theorize <coughs> urbanization. And more importantly, I think, we urgently, urgently need to revisit urban theory. It's a call to arms made by a number of people, most notably by Neil Brennan in a recent series of articles, in which he quite convincingly argued that urban theory, as we've known it in the 20th century, and which taught us a lot, is perhaps in the 21st century not any longer performative. And we need to really rethink urban theory. And I very much endorse this call. Although I may not agree with everything he has to say, I do also believe that we do need to revisit urban theory. In light, particularly of what is so close to our concern, 
which is the environmental or the ecological predicament that the world is in. In 1989, Marie Lefebvre, a famous urban theorist who has taught us a lot about urban theory in a series of books in the 60s and 70s, in one of his last papers he ever published just a few months before he died, it was published in Le Monde. Um, he did a, a, a show, it's called Planetary Urbanization. And it's worth reading today. It's not a very uplifting paper, which is very uncharacteristic for the fair. This was the guy talking about Jewish songs, pleasure, producing the city as an oeuvre of life. In one of his last pieces of work, it was centered with a sort of doom and gloom. In the piece, he introduced the notion of planetary urbanization. And as usual with Lefebvre, he was his world 20, 30 years ahead. He was ahead 20, 30 years of his world. When in 1989, that was before the world globalization was even invented, he already argued that today, 1989, we are living in a fully urbanized world. There is no outside to the urban any longer, he argued. The planet is an urbanized planet. And of course, you're all familiar with the standard statistics that are being thrown at us by uh, well, tell them, the organization that says in 20 years time, 70, 75 percent of the world's population will live in cities. This is the last time I'm going to use the word cities because I'm not interested in cities. So that's one point. First point I want to make: we do not need a city theory. We need a theory of urbanization. Urbanization is something very, very different, although connected to what we usually think of referred to as cities, like Manchester. I would argue that today the whole planet, with the fair view that today the whole planet <laughs> is urbanized. I would also argue that, and that can be easily backed up again, cities, here's the word again, cities are responsible for 80% of the world's resource use. If mines are being mined in Africa or Latin America, it's not to feed the peasants there, it is to feed urbanization. When coal tunnels are being, being extracted around the Great Lakes, intensifying a horrible civil war there, it is to feed our Facebook connectivities. It's to make our urbanized lives possible. So I would argue that every nook and cranny of the world today is fully urbanized, even though some of those places may not look like cities. When you go there, they do feel like cities because you can feel the flow that originates there. So I do think that we need to think of urbanization as, to use Maria's uh, uh, title of the book, as a configuration of socio-ecological flows. Now that seems or sounds easy and simple. But if you go out and try to theorize and even words to substantiate, to materialize urbanization as a dynamic interaction of all manner of socio-ecological flows, we find ourselves very, very quickly in a terrible mess. Because we don't know very well how to do that. There are all sorts of experiments taking place on that, but you do not know very well how to do that. So I would argue that the epistemological perspective that we need to mobilize here is one that starts, just like Alex Loftus did yesterday, that starts with the statement that things do not exist outside of the relationships through which those things become constituted. Let me repeat it. Things do not exist outside of the relationships through which 
they, those things, become or become constituted. And that's why I do not any longer want to use the word city, because city appears to us as an assemblage of all manner of things. The best those things can do is to disclose if we know how to peer into these things, to disclose the process, the flows, the socio-ecological relationships through which those things become constituted. And even a cursory analysis of these processes will quite quickly take us from Piccadilly Gardens in Manchester to every nook and cranny of the world other socio-ecological spaces and would find all manner of heterogeneous, differentiated socio-ecological landscapes through which these flows are organized. So this is the examples here that I'm thinking of is, 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 is the urban ecology of things. So every thing that constitutes the urban is nothing else than the embodiment of socio-ecological relationships. That's why I've tried in the past, one of the papers that I've put on the website, to try to conceive of these processes as circulatory, metabolic, transformatory processes. That's why I like the concept and metaphors of circulation and metaphor uh -huh. and metabolism so much. And of course I've borrowed them quite unashamedly from Marx and associated uh, Thinkers. That, of course, opens up a rather different perspective on how we think the relationship between urbanization and nature. For too long, I'll come back to that in, in a moment, for too long, we, people interested in environmental issues in cities, have concentrated on natures in the city. That's something I'm, I'm personally not particularly interested in, although, of course, it's very relevant and important too. The trees and birds and the shit, etc., in cities. But I'm not more interested, personally, in the processes through which nature becomes urbanized. The process of urbanization of nature. And I very much agree here with what Alex Loftus was saying yesterday that this process of urbanizing nature is sustained by a series of key instances that we need to be acutely aware of. It's the interweaving, I'm going to use slightly different words, but that doesn't matter uh, to those that, that, that Alex used. It's the interweaving of social relations. Things do not circulate and metabolize automatically. They're driven, the engine of social relations, material practices, institutional configurations through which these practices unfold, symbolic or discursive formations through which these practices, relations, uh, and institutions are being symbolized, talked about, theorized, and imaginaries, fantasies, cosmologies. It's that whole actually that we call capitalism, this eclectic, heterogeneous, conflict written configuration that we usually put the name capitalism on. So that as a introduction. So the strange thing that needs to be explained, what needs to be explained, I think, what needs to be accounted for in urban theory is why, why in most of our modern urban theories, particularly those of the 20th century, nature did not figure that out. Not at all. Our best theories, those that we've cherished, that we've learned a lot from, that we still mobilize from the Chicago school to the 
to the, to the quantitative urban theories of the post-war period, to the critical perspectives pioneered by the great Lefebvre's and Castells and Massey's and Harvey's of this world. Nature was symptomatically absent, disavowed. That's weird. That's actually very, very strange. And that, I think, needs to be accounted for. Because it has not always been like that. No, no kind of stupid postmodern analysis to say, well, it's because of uh, modernity, modernity, modern theory is always based on the separation of nature society, and that's why we should ditch this modern thought, etc., in favor of this kind of new eclectic postmodern. No. Go back. Do your reading again. See what people were saying in the 19th century, the great modernist pioneers of social theory. They did take nature very seriously. And one of the great ones is uh, the guy who lived around here, Friedrich Engels. Many of you undoubtedly have read this masterpiece on the condition of the working class. Now, if you read <coughs> that through a political ecological lens, it is perfect. I've learned so much about understanding socio-ecological urban injustices by reading Friedrich Engels' condition of the working class. Where do bacteria thrive? What are the great ecological niches of death and disease and the bacteria and other pathogens and pollutants in which they thrive? I don't have to explain to you where that happened. Where did the smoke go? Did the bourgeoisie know about winds? Yes, they did. And if you go around Manchester, you know where the bourgeois houses are, where the working class houses are, right? And if you know the dominant winds or western winds, you can immediately predict precisely where the elites are going to live and where those who could not afford those spaces live. Perfect, wonderful socio-ecological analysis where the material, you know, the climate, micro as well as macro, fuses together with the political economic configurations of this thriving cradle of capitalism, Manchester. And of course his comrade in arms, Karl Marx, was acutely aware of that. Some of you were taking my class reading Capital Volume 1. And clearly when you read this carefully, Marx keeps on insisting time after time after time again that every social formation, including capitalism, has to be understood, and I quote, as a socio-ecological metabolism. So that's not a word that Neil Smith invented or that I use or Alex Loftus uses or Maria uses, Marx. That's what we, where, it's, where we stole it from. And that's what he kept on insisting is the necessary mode of beginning, and that's an entry to begin to understand any form of organization. And it's through that, of course, that he talked about metabolic lift, the notion of metabolic lift. He was acutely aware that was what happening on the countryside, what geographers used to call the countryside, and what happened in the city was part and parcel of the combined and uneven geographies of a singular socio-ecological metabolism and transformation choreographed by the particular social relations of ownership, material practices of production, particular imaginaries and understanding of those, of that world, particular struggles associated with that, particular imaginaries associated with that. And of course, the less radical sociologist avant la lettre, that was sociologist before sociology became codified as an academic discipline, like Spencer, Kant, Schaffel, and others, will acutely aware that if you want to make sense of society, if you want to make sense of urbanization, the ecological material component has to be understood as an integral part of that. And then the 20th century emerged, and urban theory shifted gradually away from that, with devastating consequences. Devastating consequences, not just for theory, 
for the sale they doesn't do much. But for the practices, the imaginings, the interventions, the planning, etc., they became associated with and often built on these theories. I mean, take our greatest urban theory of the 20th century, the Chicago School. Many of you are familiar with it. Social ecology is called. It actually draws explicitly on biological metaphors right, of competition, succession, etc. But does so in a radically dematerialized form. It becomes an utterly social process, dematerialized uh, one. And then when the critiques of social ecology, Chicago School, urban sociology emerge in the 50s and 60s, in the 50s and 60s, Castell's urban question, if everyone is read it, it's wonderful. He starts off talking about the Chicago School. Right? And I said, this is real bullshit, basically. And after 150 pages of of the, of, 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 of applauding them for their great insight, they concludes that they had it all wrong, basically. To then go off on a Marxist, allegedly, trajectory of explaining urban change, and yet again, nature disappears. It is as if Castells had into that, volume one, or two, or three. So that's odd. That's odd. So I think it would be actually quite interesting as to how that procedure unfolded. <coughs> we had to wait until the late 20th century for uh, the emergent, the naturing of the city. And it was not thanks to us, urban and social theorists, that that the naturing of the city of the vanity was put back on the agenda. It was because nature began to pose a real bloody problem again. Just like it did in the 19th century. You know, the urban sanitation movement of the second half of the 19th century was not because urban theorists started thinking about social ecological metabolism, it was because the bourgeoisie got ill and was dying like flies. And that shit, we've got to clean this mess up because we're dying here. It's too good a place for bacteria and other things to thrive and live. It's not so good for us, therefore we have to clean it up and then have the sanitation of the rest of it. And something similar, although there had been some attempts, the seminal book of McCoy in the late uh, 60s, uh, Design with Nature, which is uh, how do you bring nature and na na natural processes in the city and make it work with it? Nice, sort of interesting book. Um, but what really became the torsion point, I think. And that was my generation too, yeah. was radiation. The budding environmental movement. You know, we all we all share our legacy in the cradle of the anti-nuclear movement. All of us. What we do today can be traced back there. Nuclear energy as the symptomatic torsion point that said, shit, the, uh, 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 the ecological world is in trouble. It's one of the few fights we almost won. I've been involved in so many fight resistances, etc. in my young life. Most, I've lost desperately. Yeah. But keep on fighting. Next time you fail better. <laughs> but one we almost won was the nuclear one. With a bit of help. And we got a bit of help to Mile Island and Chernobyl. And that helped in our victory. And uh, right at the moment that nuclear energy came back on the agenda to save urbanity, and to keep the lights burning, and to make sure that the world would not die from overheating, nuclear energy was staged now as the great environmentally modernizing panacea. Right? Fukushima came around. Thank God. <laughs> And then, of course, the Malthusian specter began to raise its head yet again. This is, our, this is our greatest battleground. We don't seem to be able to get rid of the Malthusian dragon. 
the myth of scarcity. That there is not enough stuff to go around. For whom is there not enough stuff to go around? For whom is there not enough stuff to go around? For whom is there never enough stuff to go around? For accumulation, for accumulation's sake. For the elite of the world, there is never enough stuff to go around. For 60% of the world's population, there's more than enough stuff to go around. And they could do with a bit more stuff to go around. Yeah. But the Malthusian specter raised his head again. Became this other sort of anchor of renaturing things. This, this great, very dangerous, exclusive elite report, the Club of Philharmonia, remember? Was an other sort of impetus for renaturing, thinking nature again seriously. It was, of course, the thought of the elites that are worried. If I were IBM, Shell, Exxon, I would be shitting it. Right. And the third thing that, of course, happened was the emergence of what the Fairfax would, 10 years later, 20 years later, call planetary urbanization. Galloping urbanization that does not seem to stop and is still not stopping. Look at places like China. It has now more than 100 cities with more than a million people. And counting. There are a billion, 200 million of them, Chinese Chinese, who will soon live in multi-million conglomerations. Think of the extraordinary social, ecological inequalities, resource hunger that is required to keep this machinery sustainable. So then, now I'm going to switch to the three ways in which our types, those who have some sort of concern with theorizing urbanization as a socio-ecological process. I'm going to quickly go to, to three perspectives. <coughs> the first one is, of course, the hegemonic one today. It has become fully hegemonic. One articulated around this great fantasy, and which is nothing else than a fantasy, with the notion of urban sustainability, fantasized in a very peculiar and very particular sort of way. That some sort of some sort of cohesive, unproblematic, simple circulatory configuration in which humans and non-humans will happily live for that with a lot. Cities are not like that. We were talking about natives earlier. Huh? Great city. Great cities are not that nice places sometimes. Uh, communities in the Amazon that are being under threat <coughs> from extinction through hydropower, resource extraction, etc. Yes, you know. And nice. we can imagine them sort of nice, cohesive sort of places. Cities are not like that. That's why many of us don't even dare to touch it. Because we have to dive into the contradictions, tensions, struggles that characterize urban life. That's why we love it. That's why we like it. That's why we live in cities and go out for six months of the year or so to work in our co communities on the other side of the world. Do you want to live there? Many of you escaped, myself included, escaped from these places precisely for these of emancipation and transformation. Precisely that what you find in the cities. So, the urban sustainability fantasy is, I think, if you look at the dominant lit uh, literature on, on, on that, structured to two interconnected perspectives. One is based on ecological rationality. The argument basically goes like this. Yes, we do know that it is a resource problem and issue. Yes, we do agree that there's a lot of waste, that there is too much excess, but we can do it differently. Through mobilizing principles of efficient, rational resource use, we'll be able to go on for a bit longer. And that, of course, is closely associated with a discourse 
and practice whereby urban sustainability is configured, imagined and practiced, practiced as a series of technology-mediated managerial configurations. The eco-technocracy associated with ecological modernization, the great example here is Mazda City for it. Mazda City, or any other ecocity that I can think of in the world. Who believes that Mazda is going to save the world from over burden? But we do, of course, know. Now, yesterday, John talked about the Polanyi's double movement, right? That is kind of encroaching techno managerial, eco efficient, economic calculus based expansion that that is not an unproblematic, let alone uncontested procedure. That's what all our work shows, time after time. Again, that's why this PhD program is on environmental conflict, right? Do we have to be surprised about that? No. Polanyi said that already 60 years ago. Let's forget about that. Let's just accept that. Now, I'm sick to death of leading yet another study on environmental conflict some place in the world. Because we by now know that that is happening. We have theorized it, we understand it, and we should perhaps shift our gaze slightly on other ways of configuring that. What much of the urban sustainability literature is based on is that it articulates around the fantasy of the possibility of socio-ecological harmony. A sort of Arcadian, utopian, harmonious configuration. Something that we've lost on our civilizing mileage. Or if you prefer the word that we've lost through the perverse powers of capitalism, if you prefer that language. I don't particularly care which one you prefer, because both suggest that there is a lost Eden. <coughs> and in the proper mobilization of knowledges and practices and technologies and imaginaries today, we can somehow restore that. Dedicated upon a vision of nature singularly, ordered and inherently harmonious. And I would argue, and I have argued in some of my papers, that this is an utterly and profoundly depoliticizing gesture. Just as a footnote, much but not all of the urban sustainability literature silences questions of inequality, equality, So we can move on to more than better. In the 1980s, we had the emergence of what is now <coughs> called the environmental justice emerged as an urban, this was actually the first sort of urban environmentalist movement that combined and fused together activist uh, mobilizations with academic, conceptual, theoretical thought. And that is why many of us are appealed by that perspective, because it does what we wanted to do, you know, articulate have conversations between activists in the streets, in the fights, and the work that we do around tables, in the libraries, and in discussions. Urban environmental justice, the you know, urban environmental justice movement and understanding is one that is fundamentally based, concerned with the distribution of environmental bads. That's how it started off. The love Kamal issue in the United States as the kind of pivotal moment, but then spread out to look, look at toxic dumps, uh, this sort of extraction factories, pollution, etc. Where the argument was a simple one environmental bads, the externalities, the negative externalities of social environmental metabolism, or proportionally landing on the poorest, powerless, most powerless segments of urban society. 
it was of course something uh, a perspective that was based on a normative ideal idea of justice John and I have and we've been here for six years together and we like each other very very much we, we, we respect each other work enormously one thing we always have big disagreements over is the use of this dreaded word justice the use of this dreaded word justice have you noticed that in much of the political ecological literature, <coughs> justice is rarely if ever used? Rarely if ever used. When I hear the word justice, I think of two authors that have shaped my understanding of justice. First one goes back to Marx, who says, justice, we should leave to the elites. Justice is a concern of the bourgeoisie. Where did he get that from? Where did he get this, this erudite man who has read and studied so much of the damn history, the Western history of philosophy and so on? Where he got it from Plato's Republic? Where in a wonderful, wonderful conversation, uh, where he, where he, Plato, that his master Socrates, engage in this wonderful dialectical conversations, discussions, the whole book, just discussions. Yeah. And in one of the discussions of justice, with Achimachus, notorious sophist, um, on justice, they conclude justice is that what is considered just by those in power. That's what my God. Yeah, I do. Now it originated in the US, the environmental justice movement, as a social environmental movement, originally primarily concerned with questions of distribution, pretty much rooted in Rawlsian notions of distributional justice, inspired by liberal notions of justice as fairness. <coughs> and where demands, political demands, articulated around the notion of equity or equality were notoriously absent. Equality is a word that's very rarely used in the environmental justice literature. Political ecologists occasionally do invoke equality. There's something very different, I'll come back to it. It for granted to race as the key axis through which social, environmental, urban injustices were articulated. <coughs> but then both the distributional notion as well as the foregrounding of race became extended. Like in Schlossberg, we talked about him on Monday, the distributional focus was extended into consideration of procedural justice, justice of capabilities and recognition. But maintained a focus on environmental bads, not on environmental goods too much. We're concerned about people who live around dumps in cities, but we do not find around getting rid of other forms of gated communities. We precisely <coughs> dump their stuff on the other side of town. And it is invariably highly localized. And that is not necessarily, that's not necessarily wrong. Any struggle is, of course, deeply rooted in particular localized practices, as, 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 as Alex said yesterday. But it was very much a sort of nimbyism. Its great contribution, of course, is that it took nature into the social. It socialized urban natures. It also began to extend injustices. And this is one of the problems with, 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 with mobilizing a normative liberal notion as justice at infinitum. 
It's not just today, of course, not its gender, its class, its disability, its age, its scale. So the biggest injustice in cities is single African American unmarried women on welfare with disability. That's okay. Environmental justice is about particular particularizing universals. Justice is a universal term. And it becomes fragmented in endless particularizations. Which is radically, radically opposed to what I and many others would consider to be a proper political procedure, which is about universalizing particulars. Universalizing particulars is very, very different from particularizing universal. Let me give you an example of those who have difficulties conceptualizing what the difference is. Universalizing the particular is today visible, profoundly visible in the bodies, the ecology, social ecologies of undocumented immigrants. Our particular situation exposes the inequality of what is notionally called the democratic society. Our particular struggle is one that aspires to our universalization of equality in a democratic policy. See the difference between universalizing the particular versus particularizing universals. And urban environmental injustice, or the urban environmental justice movement, focuses primarily on patterns of socio-spatial environmental injustices rather than on the processes of their production in the way that I exemplified it in the beginning. So then, political ecology, well my particular take on it, I can't speak for every political ecologist in the world, that's my take on urban political ecology. Here the focus is really on something rather different, I would argue. Of course, urban political ecology does not deny or ignore the profound distributional inequalities in the socio-ecological metabolism that sustains ur urbanization. But nonetheless, its entry point is on the production of urban socio-environmental inequalities. A production process which is the production of human and non-human assemblages as they become constituted in this flow, the circulatory metabolic flow. And would argue that the distributional configuration of that can only be properly located, understood and identified through the archaeology of the production of the socio-ecological Flows. Today, this a production of human and non-human assembly is predicated upon the increasing mobilization and the enrolling of nature. I like this word enrolling. The nature, and I'm using now nature in plural and with small letter n. Not this kind of big thing out there, but the heterogeneous, variegated things, non-human out there, become increasingly enrolled in processes of capital accumulation and circulation as a socio-metabolic process. And I understand metabolism here as a process, and I think this quote comes from Gavin, Gavin Blitz, but I'm not sure. Physical matter such as water or cows, are transformed into usable, ownable, and tradable commodities. That is what is meant by the socio-metabolic production of nature. And of course this is predicated of necessity within social relations of property ownership and the appropriation of nature 
of value as value. I insist, and this comes straight out of David Harvey. Now, David, one of David's great books is called The Urbanization of Capital. What does he want to say here? That capital as the spatial form, the spatial form of the self-expansion of value that we call capital is urbanization. So in parallel to that, large-scale urbanization is the, and the large-scale urbanization of all manner of nature is the spatial form today of capital accumulation with all manner of unintended outcomes for the various social groups, etc., that make up the urban family. Urban political ecology is decidedly anti-Malthusian. It sees scarcity as socially produced. Socially produced by the twin imperative of accumulation for accumulation's sake. The wolf's hunger for more, 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 irrespective of the social, ecological, and other consequences. When growth stopped, that's why I like the degrowth movement in many ways, they're absolutely right. Theoretically, politically, not performative, I would argue, but theoretically, profoundly right. Accumulation for accumulation's sake, on the one hand, and the market. <coughs> the market cannot function without the construction of scarcity. And of course, this urban social physical environment, the urbanization of nature, reflects the power relationship that is inscribed in the social ecological metabolism. Although I have used these, these dreadful words, accumulation for accumulation's sake and capitalism, I, of course, as I've said in my introduction, but will insist on again, does not operate outside and in parallel to all manner of other configurations, such as institutional <coughs> configurations, things that we used to call the state. And Giacomo on Monday called for a revisiting of state theory and political ecology is urgently needed because our state, our quasi state understandings of political ecology are weak, very, very weak. We understand institutions well, we understand the act of governing well. The theories of the state, or what today is the act of governing, which includes much more than the traditional state. Where's Gramsci? Where's Polanza? Can we still do something with them? The best we can do, it seems, is to insist that what we're living today in is a Foucauldian biopolitical regime of dis disciplining the population. And I agree with that, but that ain't good enough. And of course, and of course, this process is always articulated with heterogeneous and variegated imaginaries and fantasies. The urbanization of nature is multi-scaled, that I think is unproblematic, and therefore never just local. It always is simultaneously translocal and often global. And these connectivities across scales have to be taken into consideration. Its emphasis is not on justice, in the way in which environmental justice thinks about it. It is based on a thoroughly political notion of equality. Equality. But I would argue that that is not very often explicitly theorized, thought through in terms of its implication. I'm now going to move to some of the challenges. And my overall call here is to get the balance right. We call ourselves political ecologists. What we really do is a critique of political ecology. In the same way in which capital was a critique of political economy. But most of us, myself included, 
usually do in our work is a critique of political ecology. This is a critical analysis of the political ecological configuration of the world that we inhabit. That doesn't do full justice to the word political in our little combination of political ecology. On the ecological side, we can more or less all agree, you know? Yeah. And we have this kind of unspoken assumption that we are politically all on the right side. That is left of the spectrum. Without the spectrum. Mm -hmm. But what that means, no one dares to say. Because if you were to start having a discussion about that, you would immediately open up a massive Pandora's box. <laughs> <laughs> what are we? I think we should precisely do that. Because I think opening that Pandora's box is precisely what we need today. That is to re foreground, to foreground again the political, in the political ecology, unity. That is what inspires the, my final um, four, I think I have four sort of terrains that I find important to see through today. So, the first one, and, it, and all articulates around the question of whether we can and whether we should, which I leave open for debate, I'm not going to answer that, but I think it's a question issue worth posing. Whether we can, which I don't know whether we can do that, whether we should, which I have my personal opinion, but we probably have different opinions on that. Move from thinking through environmental conflict slash movements, slash strategies, etc. To thinking through eco-political practices and performances. Whether we should move from movements to politics. There are a number of issues here. I insist, and I've insisted in some of my writings, that critical thought has outlived its useful life. That does not mean we shouldn't do that. I do critical thought, I hope, and I teach it. And I think it should be taught, it should be practiced, it should be studied. What I do think that needs to be the thought is the assumption, the assumption that our critical, political, ecological thought is politically performative, that actually does something. We want our world to be useful, don't we? We want to support our allies who are fighting their fights here, there, and everywhere. We hope that that is part of a kind of transformative Alex's work yesterday, that transcends resistance. I'm so fed up with this word resistance. I mean, yesterday evening, when I was going through this in my hot, drunken stupid after the Indian <laughs> restaurant, uh, I was rehearsing what I'm going to say to more than how I'm going to say it. Mm. I googled the word resistance. Where does this thing come from? Why do we use it all the time? And of course, after I saw the websites, I, I could have. You know, that's what Google does. It stops us thinking. You know, you know, this where it goes from Google, you no know, Wikipedia. You know, if I just had sat down for five minutes, you know, I could have come up with exactly the same answer, of course. You know. La résistance. La résistance. Yeah? French résistance. Fighting for a French liberation for Mother France against the evil empire of the Nazis. Sure, you could find the same words in Greece fighting the dictatorship. In the Second World War, we called the same in Dutch. Was it about transformation? No. It was to save our souls and our world, which is important. I, I, I do not, do not misunderstand me. 
It was not, although some of the members of the existing movements were fighting for the communist society, the socialist, but by no means all, by no means all, the code word was resistance which blurred together all manner of very unlikely partners from extreme nationalists to that of the communists in unholy alliances. The Spanish can talk about that too, I think. I think urban, in fact, it's political ecology is concerned with transformation. Not any kind of transformation. Egalitarian, democratic, environmentally and socially inclusive transformation. And I'm not any longer that convinced that critical political ecology helps us in doing so. Stuck as it is in critique and the associated politics of resistance. Not that they should not happen. It's not good enough. Opens up a whole fabric. Which opens up something that we are really not good at. This political theory. No one does that. Very few. I try to dabble with that. Because I'm so really hard. What the hell are we doing? And it's very intriguing listening to all your fantastic projects. Politics always figures in it somehow. Institutions, confederations, the state. But the political? Hobbes, Rousseau, Socrates, Plato, Rancière, Badiou, Lefort, who? <laughs> I think perhaps we should think that too. So that we can begin to elucidate a bit better the relationship, if any, between our social environmental analysis on the one hand and political action. Not just any political action, democratic political action. You know, the democratic uh, political has no notion of justice. <coughs> what does the democratic political assume? Equality. Equality. Not as some sort of normative concept. Not at all. Equality is staged by those who stage equality, demand it, claim it. It's not up to me to decide what is just or unjust, who is or what is equal or unequal. Those who are in position of inequality know full well. They know full well and they can precisely express that too. And we may want to help them with that. <coughs> and around which ultimately the key question is the issue of the democratic, socio-ecologically inclusive management of the commons. I think that is, for me, what it's all about, ultimately. And there is a lot, a lot, a lot of work to be done there. Second, if I don't know why I have put number one here, don't know That is not to say that we should not do political, ecological, material analysis, but we should, I would argue, do it in a, a globe, in a, in a ground, global where we shall follow the social ecological metabolism that links everything in its heterogeneity and conflicting nature together. How it's all stitched together. That's difficult to do. We know how to study a mind and what it does in a community. That we know, that's difficult, that's difficult enough. But we know more or less how to do that. Plenty of very, very, very good examples. Yeah. And then we do a PhD and say, oh, I'm going to do the same thing yet somewhere else. Which is fine, which is fine, but it ain't good enough. We shouldn't shy away from the more difficult things and try to do them, even if we don't do them well, at least we've tried. Secondly or thirdly, I think we political ecologists, as well as political economists, political theorists in general, we always run late. We always run behind the facts. 
we think we are a progressive. We are always years behind what is really actually happening in the world. A great example of that is the whole debate around neoliberalizing the urbanization of nature. There's lots of literature on that. Neoliberalism, this, that, and the other. I would argue since three years, neoliberalism is that. It's that as a donkey for at least three years. It lives on as some sort of spectral zombie. But it's phantasmic imaginary as a utopia of a market led ideal world is not even any longer defended by the great advocates of it. But it cannot. The reality show it cannot. We are living today in a fully collectively assisted form of accumulation for accumulation's sake. The, 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 the history of the responses to the financial crisis is precisely that. We are living today in a properly socialist world. It's a socialism of the elites. But the elites have been extremely good at mobilizing the collective for their collective interests. Greece, Spain, Ireland are great living examples of that. When I was in Greece a while ago, <coughs> I saw all these little pickup trucks going into the forest and coming out, piled up with wood. With that smell in the streets of the city. Athens smells differently today, I guess, compared to a few years ago. <coughs> I've been in Athens, but that's where Niki, where I often go, smells differently today. <coughs> <coughs> Fourthly, I think we should be a bit more critical with respect to our great heroes, our allies, our friends and comrades in struggle, our environmental movements. We tend to celebrate, and we should, don't misunderstand me, we often should. They are indeed our world, our allies, our interlocutors. Bill Gates and Warren Buffett are not going to listen to us, ever, ever. Whatever we argue, however good our theoretical arguments, we will not convince them, ever. We are very clear as to who our interlocutors are who we speak to, who we write for. But let's not romanticize movements like that. Many of them, almost all of them, are actually reactionary. Inherently reactionary, not all of them. But certainly those that are in the violence. A fight against the mind is inherently reactionary. Inherently reactionary. And we should be acutely aware of that. It is a fight against an external intruder. That's what resistance is. And there might be important elements, there might be very, very good reasons to do so. Don't again misunderstand me. They're inherently localized. Yeah? We don't like nimbyism of the elites in cities in the global north, in the gated safe ecological and social havens, but we love the nimbyism of an Amazonian endogenous people. Why? We tend to focus on social mobilizations and the various repertoires of action associated with that, almost invariably articulated around victims and grievances. However hard it is, however, I mean, however serious they are, and they matter, I think thinking through transformation is about 
hope, battlement. Hugo yesterday mentioned in the talk, uh, asked the question, uh, asked John, John and Neil, I, I, I mentioned that there was very poor communities in southern Chile are split. They are not these hom homogeneous communities at all. Some love these things to come. Others hate them to come. There is no egalitarianism necessarily in those communities. Those communities are split as much, not as much necessarily, not, not, as, not as much, but are split too. Just like urban, urbanized <coughs> city communities are inherently split. And that's the challenge. How do we maintain equality, transformation in social configurations where the word community should really not be used in any kind of homogeneous? <coughs> and now we can think through a process that moves from resistance to transformation. So we're very, very good at critiquing excess. <coughs> Capitalism is indeed about social and ecological excess. The waste, the toxic configurations, the endless transformation of nature. This is excessive. It is excessive. Do we want to go back to a Protestant ethic? The very roots of capitalism and its success? Of course not. We want a different excess. We want to be excessive too in our lives, don't we? How do we do that? How do we think that through? How do we imagine, formulate different forms of excessiveness? That would be my argument against the de Gaulle as a political instantiation. Which brings me to my final, I'm finishing now. <coughs> to the final slide is there. We're thinking through a variety of urban but decidedly political socio ecological imaginings. What Maria would call radical fantasies. In a grand way. Not as a utopian way, not something to happen but something that we know is already lurking here and now in the material interstices of actual socio-ecological conditions and how we can universalize these particulars. How we can universalize these particulars. We all have our examples, <coughs> localized examples of different, different attempts, experimentations, with social ecological assemblings that are more inclusive, more democratic, etc. What is our mission? To universalize that. To universalize that. If need be, by all means possible. And in order to do so, perhaps, I'm going to conclude with that, is to shift our emphasis from ecology to the political, not because we do not think ecology or nature does not matter, but precisely because we do know it matters. But we also should keep on insisting that if we want to take nature's and kind of socio-ecological configuration really <coughs> seriously, it's the political where it resides. It's the political where it resides not in nature. So the challenge is, how can we produce, you know, come back to my notion of the production of human, non-human assemblages. For us, I think, the theoretical and practical challenges, how we can think through and act on the production of historically materialist, egalitarian, socio-environmental imaginary. It is indeed, for many of us, as Frederick Jameson so eloquently put it 20 years ago, easier to imagine the end of the world 
than to imagine any real changes in the eco-capitalist order that we live in and its inequities. That's it. Particularly of what is so close to our concern, which is the environmental or the ecological predicament that the world is in. In 1989, Henri Lefebvre, a famous urban theorist who has taught us a lot about urban theory in a series of books in the 60s and 70s, in one of his last papers he ever published just a few months before he died, was published in Le Monde. Um, he did a, a, a short, <coughs> it's called Planetary Urbanization. And it's worth reading today. It's not a very uplifting paper, which is very uncharacteristic for the fair. This was the guy talking about Jewish songs, pleasure, producing the city as an oeuvre of life. In one of his last pieces of work, it was centered with a sense of doom and gloom. In that piece, he introduced the notion of planetary urbanization. And as usual with Lefebvre, he was his world 20, 30 years ahead. He was ahead 20, 30 years of his world. When in 1989, that was before the world globalization was even invented, he already argued that today, 1989, we are living in a fully urbanized world. There is no... Previously, he was professor of geography at Oxford University, fellow Oxford University, and fellow of St. Peter's College until 2006. His research interests include political ecology, urban governance, democracy and political power, water, water resources, the political economy of capitalist societies, and the politics of globalization. He has published over 100 papers on these themes. And recent books include Urbanizing Globalization, uh, co-edited with Oxford University Press, Social Power in the Urbanization of Water, Flows of Power, again Oxford University Press, uh, In the Nature of Cities, co-edited, um, published by Routledge, and a monograph uh, on nature, modernity, and Spain uh, is forthcoming with MIT Press. Uh, sorry. Thank you very much. Maria, usually it's a pleasure to uh, speak um, at occasions like this, but today I am suffering very much from intensive PhD training fatigue. <laughs> <laughs> My apologies for that. I would also like to uh, welcome, as you probably haven't met her yet, uh, Saska Petrova. This is the woman in, white, in, in yellow and black there. I welcome her here, not just because it's great to have her here, but we will have her for a long, long time here. She is our new colleague, uh, just appointed in uh, Geography in the School of Environment and Development, and even more importantly, she is also a political ecologist working on themes like biodiversity, nature preservation and energy issues. Welcome. And an activist. Okay. And an activist. <laughs> Thank so she fits in really well. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, secondly, um, until last week, I thought I was going to talk about something different than what I'm actually going to talk about. I wanted to talk about metabolism and circulation, urban metabolism and urban circulation. It's one of the papers that I put on the website um, in the Dropbox thing. But then I thought, why should I talk about something that all of you can read? about anyway. So I changed my mind just two days ago about what I was going to present. So this is a bit more tentative and we'll really try to focus on a number of issues and themes that I think are unresolved. 
because many of us are always asked, why do you do what you're doing? Sure, you're interested in environmental conflict here, there, wherever, but why? What is new, interesting, different? What should I learn from someone who's doing work in the Amazon or in the Himalayas or whatever? What should I outside to the urban any longer, he argued. The planet is an urbanized planet. And of course, you're all familiar with the standard statistics that are being thrown at us by uh, well, tell you know, the organization that says in 20 years time, 70, 75 percent of the world's population will live in cities. This is the last time I'm going to use the word cities because I'm not interested in cities. So that's one point. First point I want to make: we do not need a city theory. We need a theory of urbanization. Urbanization is something very, very different, although connected to what we usually think of referred to as cities, like Manchester. I would argue that today the whole planet, with the fair view that today the whole planet is urbanized. I would also argue that, and that can be easily backed up again, cities, here's the word again, cities are responsible for 80% of the world's resource use. If mines are being mined in Africa or Latin America, it's not to feed the peasants there, it is to feed urbanization. When coal town is being, coal town is being extracted around the Great Lakes, intensifying a horrible civil war there, it is to feed our Facebook connectivities. It's to make our urbanized lives possible. So I would argue that every nook and cranny of the world today is fully earned by learn. Not everyone else learned from that. And that's sometimes a question that's extremely difficult to answer. Um, uh, and I don't always have answers to these questions either. So what I want to focus on towards the end of my talk are the set of issues that I think political ecology or urban political ecology in this case really needs to uh, 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 take a bite at. My main ambition as an academic interested in questions of cities, societies and nature is to theorize urbanization. And more importantly, I think, we urgently urgently need to revisit urban theory. It's a call to arms made by a number of people, most notably by Neil Brennan in a recent series of articles, in which he quite convincingly argued that urban theory as we've known it in the 20th century, and which taught us a lot, is perhaps in the 21st century not any longer performative. And we need to really rethink urban theory. And I very much endorse this call. And I may not agree with everything he has to say, I do also believe that we do need to revisit urban theory in light 